some people. Okay, thank you all for coming. Um, so I'm Gail Denoffer, I'm gonna be the moderator today and we're uh, very excited that you could come and talk to us and we can talk to you about buprenorphine in the era of fentanyl. And uh, I'm going to introduce everyone up front and then everyone will just go through their talks. We're, there are about 15 minutes each and you can ask some questions if you want. In between, just say who you are and we have some um, microphones we can go around because this session is being recorded. So they'd like to hear your question and who you are and so that would be really great. So I'm gonna go through and um, talk to you a little bit about who we have here so we're really fortunate to have some experts with us today. We're gonna to start off with Dr. Mark Greenwald who will be talking about the neuropharmacological principles for effective bup um, induction. Uh, Dr. Greenwald is professor and the Gertrude Levin Endowed Chair in Addiction and Pain Biology, Associate Department Chair for Research and Director of the Substance Abuse Research Division in the Department of Psychiatry and Behavioral Neurosciences with joint appointments in the Department of Pharmacy Practice at Wayne State University. His research has focused on determinants and mechanisms of persistent drug use and developing novel medication and neuromodulation treatments, primarily focused on opiates. He has multiple publications and we're really excited to have him here. That will follow by Dr. Katherine Hawk, who's going to talk about strategies for ED bup induction and different dosing schedules. Dr. Hawk is an associate professor in the Department of Emergency Medicine and attending physician at Yale New Haven Hospital. She was a former NIDR scholar and the drug use addiction and HIV research scholar and she's board certified in EM and in addiction medicine. Her research primarily focuses on opiate overdose prevention and a focus on harm reduction and linkage to treatment for ED patients with opiate use disorder. Um, she is funded by NIDA. She's also funded by the Foundation of the Opiate Response Foundation. And um, recently, along with Dr. Herring, is, is funded by NIDA on high dose versus standard dosing of um, buprenorphine in ED patients. And then we uh, follow not greatly, not last but not least, by Dr. Andrew Herring. Dr. Herring um, is a uh, associate professor in the Alameda Health System in Oakland, California and UCSF, where he is an attending physician and director of research. At Alameda, he is the chief of addiction medicine and a past medical director of the Foundation Functional Restoration Pain Clinic. He has led numerous efforts to transform hospital-based care for substance use disorder, and his work has been featured really quite widely. He is the founded and the PI of California Bridge, one of the largest state-level efforts to promote access to medication for opiate disorder in hospital setting, and his research is funded by many organizations, including PCORI and, um, and NIDA, and we're really excited to have him here. He will talk about um, treatment of precipitated withdrawal. So with that, we will go forward, and uh, we have, Dr. Greenwell has some disclosures that are up there. The rest of us do not have anything to disclose other than our foundation, our funding. And um, we have talked about our presenters that we're really excited to have here. And so just in the background, if you um, have read recently, we were able to publish this paper. We were very excited about it. And um, it was about the low incident of precipitated withdrawal during a uh, trial that we are now uh, still ongoing. This trial is looking at um, patients who have used the traditional sublingual buprenorphine induction versus um, CAM 2038, which is a seven day injectable by Brayburn, which is just about to be um, released from the FDA in a couple of uh, months. It is being used in um, Europe and has been since 2000, I believe, 18. Um, it is um, a very small injection. It is good for around seven days, and we are looking at the difference between um, the use of induction in both of these types of formulations and patients' um, abilities to get to treatment. Um, but during that trial, what we found and published in the first 1,200 patients is that even in this era of fentanyl, we only had nine cases of uh, precipitated withdrawal. These, um, our, we do constant um, surveillance and we have uniform definitions 
and we have um, two very uh, famous uh, people, Dr. Sharon Walsh and um, Dr. Michelle Lofwell from Kentucky, who did the phase um, two trials with CAM 2038, and they adjudicate any of the issues of precipitated withdrawal. And we found that overall, as you can see in 28 sites around the country, um, we only had these nine episodes of precipitated withdrawal. As of today, we have around 1,510 patients who are enrolled in the trial, and we have 10 cases. Um, six cases are with sublingual, and four cases are still with the um, injectable. And that's in light of around 76% of the entire sample having fentanyl in their urine. We do point of care testing. So we have seen that we've been able to do this. Um, many places have anecdotally said that they have problems um, with inductions, but overall um, we have not had it. We do have very few people, around 3%, who refuse to be in the study, and we have a follow-up of around 85%. So we think that if there was something that we were missing, we would, we would clearly be able to see that. So overall, in the paper that was published in JAMA Network Open just at the end of uh, April, we saw that um, our precipitate raw withdrawal rate was 0.76, but as of now, it's less than 0.5. So uh, we could not, and um, you can look it up in this paper, we could not find really anything specifically or any phenotype around who are those individuals of the entire group, why did they go into precipitated withdrawal. There's really, you know, many, all of them had fentanyl in their urine. Many of them had different um, substances in their urine, as you can see, and there was a group, fair variability on their use of, uh, when their last use of um, any opiate was, from ranging really from eight to I think 24. So it was a very long variability. They were, good news is they were all discharged from the ED, one left um, AMA, but all of the rest were all discharged and uh, some stayed overnight of an observation as in our group many of them have unstable housing. So you could look that up if you want and so I want to pass this along um, right now to Dr. Greenwall so he can talk to you about the neuropharmacological principles. Thanks, Gail. Good morning, everybody. So this is uh, what, truths, trends. Uh, I'll give you uh, some truths first. Um, there's some misconceptions around uh, buprenorphine and I just wanted to start with a, uh, a gearhead slide. Um, uh, this is an in vitro study of the um, ability of buprenorphine at different concentrations uh, in vitro to activate uh, four different receptor uh, subtypes, mu, kappa, delta, and uh, nociceptin receptors or orphan receptors. And <clears throat> uh, we normally hear in the literature that buprenorphine has different pharmacological attributes. So. Um, the curve on the left in sort of cream is, shows the kind of classic partial agonist um, action. So this is the, uh, the y-axis is the ability of buprenorphine to stimulate G-protein coupled receptors and activate intracellular signaling pathways. Um, it, the idea that buprenorphine is a partial agonist though has been sort of overgeneralized. We, we know that buprenorphine has uh, analgesic effects that are not limited by dose, but the respiratory depressant effects are. So we need to discriminate when we're talking about partial agonism, whether we're talking about the activation in the biology or whether we're talking about the endpoints clinically that we're, talk, uh, that we're measuring. So there's not a ceiling effect for every measure. It is a partial agonist at mu receptors. Uh, it's an antagonist at kappa and delta receptors, so that's why the orange and the black uh, 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 data points there are, are pretty flat, um, so it doesn't um, uh, generate a, a, G, a GPR signal. Um, and uh, so there's no evidence in clinically, despite animal models, that the kappa or the delta antagonist properties of buprenorphine mediate its clinical efficacy. Uh, you know, we would need specific pharmacological tools to demonstrate that that, um, that only exists right now in animal models. So there's also sort of a, a nociception, a misconception, I call, um, uh, which is that buprenorphine, as you can see in the red 
dose response curve um, does activate nociceptin receptors, but there's a three log unit or a thousand fold shift in potency. So um, much less potent at new, uh, nociceptin than at new receptors. And of course, we don't have clinically a thousand fold difference in buprenorphine doses. So the uh, uh, wonderful law of parsimony, Occam's razor tells us, well, if that's the case, then really all we need to focus on is buprenorphine's actions um, at mu receptors. <clears throat> so there's complexity in what happens when you give um, buprenorphine at various doses or concentrations and what it does um, in the periphery, measured in, as, in terms of plasma concentrations or in the brain, measured you like using PET imaging and mu receptor occupancy. So what I'm gonna show you here is that what we've learned from studies um, in humans is that a, a moderate level of mu receptor occupancy by buprenorphine um, in a sort of chronic dosing situation um, is associated with um, uh, the suppression of opioid withdrawal symptoms. There is variability across people and that is represented here by the horizontal bar. That's, that's variance across people. We also see that a moderate level of buprenorphine also suppresses craving, but because the bar is wider, that means there's more between subject variability. So it's a little bit less predictable across folks. Um, you know, and so a better marker of buprenorphine dosing is withdrawal rather than craving because of that heterogeneity. But what we really want to do clinically is to uh, suppress on top opioid use. We, we wanna use buprenorphine as, as a vehicle uh, for promoting abstinence to the extent possible. Uh, if we give a challenge dose of a drug like uh, hydromorphone dilaudid in, in the lab, we can see that it, it can block liking, but we to get that suppression of a liking response, which is associated with uh, abuse liability, and FDA actually uses that as, as a standard measure, um, we see that it, we need to be at a higher concentration uh, to, to suppress that response. To actually block instrumental seeking of drugs, uh, of opioids in the lab, we need to see a higher level of receptor occupancy, and then to block the respiratory depressant effects of an on top do, a dose of like high dose hydromorphone um, that needs to be even higher. So what are the, some of the implications here? Well, obviously, if we're not even covering any of these endpoints, then clearly that's underdosing. A less obvious instance of underdosing is if you're only suppressing craving and withdrawal, but somebody's still using on top, you're still underdosing. This is where we want to be in terms of harm reduction. And we, we want to be blocking the on top use, the subjective response that somebody gets because that feeds into their belief, oh, I can use any time now on top and get away with it, I can have my cake and eat it too. Uh-uh. We wanna be higher so that we're also blocking instrumental drug seeking behavior and we wanna block the respiratory toxicity. So in the fentanyl era, high dose buprenorphine treatment is harm reduction. Okay, we need to be keeping these thre clinical thresholds in mind and, and, and thinking about them in a way that's gonna translate into better outcomes for patients. So fentanyl, as you all know, has high lip lipophilicity, it's got high affinity and high intrinsic efficacy at mu opioid receptors. So affinity is A, lipophilicity is L, intrinsic efficacy is E. We developed um, in, in paper that we published last fall um, uh, this, this idea of an opioid agonist having an ale value. It's the mathematical product of those three uh, parameters. So drugs that um, have um, high ale values also, as it turns out, tend to cause more mu receptor phosphorylation, internalization, and desensitization of receptors. So those downstream effects that I was telling you about that are due to the G-protein coupled signaling, those you know, higher AL opioid is going to result in pharmacological effects that take longer to recover, and that's going to put somebody at risk of precipitated withdrawal if you don't watch yourself. So fentanyl doses that are misused um, uh, may surmount low to moderate daily doses of buprenorphine, particularly if fentanyl is used at trough levels of, of buprenorphine. Super analgesic 
doses of fentanyl, like above, say, 0.4 mg per 70 kg, um, might even surmount higher daily buprenorphine doses, um, but we don't have a lot of empirical data. So I, I put together, uh, based on uh, equal potency estimates and some work that we did earlier with looking at hydromorphone and buprenorphine interactions in the lab uh, under controlled conditions, uh, basically, if you look at the blue curve, that's a fentanyl alone dose response curve. And we, we know that two milligrams of fentanyl is roughly a leaf, lethal dose in, in, in someone, certainly in someone who's naive, and um, with someone who's got higher tolerance, that game changes. But um, the idea is that as you add more and more buprenorphine on board, it shifts the fentanyl dose response curve to the right. It makes it less potent. Okay, so that reduction in fentanyl potency also translates into less fentanyl abuse potential and respiratory toxicity. So what used to be a lethal dose of fentanyl is no longer a lethal dose. So buprenorphine, getting people onto buprenorphine has its known challenges. And so we uh, developed this model. And, and I just want to walk you through this a little bit in, in case you haven't read our paper, which I encourage you to do. Um, Andrew's a, a co-author on this. And uh, the, the, the basic idea is that um, the acute outcome of buprenorphine induction, which is shown here on the y-axis, as higher values are more agonist effect, negative values are withdrawal, okay, and zero is neutral. And we call that opioid balance. So if you have a positive balance, you got more agonist effect. If you have a negative balance, withdrawal effect. So the acute outcome on the y-axis is a function of what you're experiencing and observing at baseline for the patient who's presenting in the ED. So if somebody is in withdrawal, you can be very assertive with your buprenorphine dosing and get an agonist effect on, on top of that. You have very little to worry about. But as the agonist balance moves towards neutral and then into positive territory, say someone's come in after a fentanyl overdose, you haven't reversed them, you're just waiting it out, whatever, or you didn't, you know, you, you, you dosed them with naloxone and they're re-narcotizing. If, if there's agonist on board, they're still at risk, and the odds of precipitated withdrawal shown on the right y-axis here increase. It's a reverse y-axis, so that's why down is worse. So, buprenorphine, this, this graph also shows, uh, by the way, there's, there's another uh, x-axis here, and that the, the symptomatic effects shown on the upper x-axis really kind of correspond to the percentage of mu opioid receptors that are occupied at a given time, and the inset shows that that's actually a classic sort of dose-response sigmoidal relationship. <clears throat> so. Buprenorphine induction is going to also differ as a function of what opioid preceded it, okay? So those high ale value uh, opioids like fentanyl, um, which produce, you know, more desensitization, internalization, phosphorylation, longer time to resensitize mu receptors, that's going to lead to a more bu a difficult buprenorphine induction. And that's why the blue curve here shows a higher rate or risk of precipitated withdrawal, and it's also going to take um, a longer time for you to manage them, <laughs> most likely, in the ED, and why some of this model actually is going to extend beyond the ED for that reason. So extended exposure to fentanyl before buprenorphine producing physical dependence can increase the probability and severity of precipitated withdrawal because that desensitization hasn't been fully reversed. The restorative processes haven't uh, had time to fully take effect. So what are the clinical implications? What do you do in terms of dosing to avoid precipitated withdrawal, maximize your agonist effects? So somebody who you're dosing in the ED gets a good response and they're more likely to want to continue to take buprenorphine. Well, when there is a residual agonist effect, when the person before you start buprenorphine has that positive opioid agonist balance, um, intermediate starting doses of buprenorphine, we estimate in the range of 1 to 12 milligrams. Um, that's going to increase the risk of precip uh, precipitated withdrawal, and so I've shaded an area uh, in which I fondly call the donut hole, um, and uh, the, you want to stay out of the donut hole. So intermediate doses are actually where the greatest risk is. Why? 
Well, intermediate buprenorphine doses displace enough residual agonist, and that can precipitate withdrawal, but those buprenorphine doses are insufficient to maximally stimulate spare functional mu opioid receptors. So in contrast, macrodosing, shown here in the red curve, starting doses of at least 16 milligrams sublingual, or microdosing, shown in the blue curve, starting doses less than a half a milligram sublingual, are gonna be better tolerated with less chance of precipitated withdrawal. So when baseline withdrawal is present, macrodosing, in the red, is gonna to lead to a greater positive agonist balance, a good outcome, whereas Microdosing won't replace residual agonist and abstinence withdrawal is gonna persist. It's counterproductive to do microdosing when somebody's already in withdrawal. You're just not gonna be giving them enough, okay? So that's the pharmacological theory. Let's take this up to 10,000 feet. What does this really mean kind of in terms of risk benefit, okay, for what you're doing as clinicians? Macrodosing is most effective under conditions of baseline withdrawal when there's minimal mu receptor occupancy from prior opioid exposure. So shown in blue here, um, the benefit to risk is high. You can be really confident about that, especially the worse the with baseline withdrawal is. As you near neutral territory where there's an even balance between agonist and, and, and withdrawal symptoms, you start to get into a, a riskier territory um, and that's because um, uh, the, the reason why mic macrodosing works is, is because um, mu receptors are likely to have undergone these restorative processes. So buprenorphine can occupy and fully stimulate these receptors. So microdosing, um, in, shown in the, the gold uh, triangle, can be effective and it's safe under conditions of baseline agonist activity. Um, uh, it, it's, uh, it's better when uh, you have low ale opioids like heroin and morphine compared to high ale opioids like fentanyl and hydromorphone. Um, so the risk varies as a function of what that prior opioid was. <clears throat> so the reason is that mu receptors remain partly occupied and desensitized from prior opioid exposure. So lower buprenorphine doses can gradually reoccupy and resensitize mu receptors without precipitating withdrawal. And so in the gray area, I've illustrated that more empirical data are needed in situations where agonist baseline conditions um, prevail to, so we can understand these risk-benefit trade-offs. So th there's an actual um, questionnaire instrument that I've used in about 15 published studies now um, called the Opiate 32. And um, if you look down the list, you know, starting the left, the, the odd-numbered items, uh, yawning, restless, watery eyes, runny nose, uh, et cetera, all of those are withdrawal symptoms. The even numbered items, starting with nodding, dry mouth, turning of stomach, skin itchy, relaxed, those are agonist items. So what you can do is you can actually calculate the opioid balance. You can take, add up the scores. Each item is scored on a zero to four scale. So the total of the 16 agonist items is up to zero to 64, same for withdrawal. And you can just subtract the total and you can see where somebody is. So you could actually use this potentially in the ED and, and, and as we've done in, in the laboratory in many studies. So final messages, buprenorphine partial agonism um, at mu receptors, not so much at kappa, delta, or nociceptin, mediates its complex clinical effects. We want to achieve high-dose buprenorphine as quickly as is reasonable to reduce post-discharge harms uh, because that's really important in this fentanyl area, fentanyl era. Fentanyl has high ale value, so this ha means it's basically got slow offset kinetics. And that's gonna constrain, and it's gonna tie your hands on how fast you can go with buprenorphine induction when somebody presents to the ED. So if the patient is in withdrawal, be assertive. Go for it, you can dose heavily with uh, buprenorphine up to your, your, your hospital limits or whatever. Uh, agonist state, if somebody's in a positive balance, you're gonna need to go slower, we're still working out different kinds of algorithms. Uh, Dr. Herring can tell you about that. Um, but we wanna avoid that donut hole, those intermediate doses, because risk of precipitated withdrawal is highest there. So I'm gonna stop, and um, I don't know where we are in terms of time, uh, but happy to take any questions, or we can move on um, if necessary. Bring it. Here, we're gonna, there,
Um, so I'm Rachel, I'm Rachel Harosen from Cooper yes. and Camden. Um, so we, when we started doing all this work years ago, we were unequivocally told that 16 milligrams translated to about 97% occupancy, right? And so we used that 16 milligrams. Now, we don't even, I don't even macrodose with 16. We do 16, 16, 16 just to treat withdrawal and just to you know, treat the patient. Is there any data to show what occupancy is like now in the era of fentanyl? Because I would suspect that there's a lot of upregulation. There's just, it's a different dynamic. That's a fantastic question, Rachel. Thank you. Um, so one thing that we always have to be careful about is that that, that peak receptor occupancy is always at CMAX. It, it, you know, they, they, that's at its peak effect. It doesn't stay that way all day, right? We, we actually have done time course studies, and, and we see that it, it goes away over the course of, of a single day. So you need to stay on top of it. You need to do repeated dosing. As to why you may need more in this fentanyl era, Yes, it's entirely possible that um, that, that, that down regulation uh, of a receptor, so like Bmax, you know, in, in pharmacological terms, um, might might change. But we, as I've sort of explained, I, th I think we also know that fentanyl, especially in somebody who's using it repeatedly to the level of physical dependence, has profound effects. On, on not just receptor number, but on the functional status of those receptors. So that's why I always talk about spare, unoccupied, functional, that all that GPCR machinery is working and, and can actually deliver signals to the cell nucleus to, you know, because ultimately it's, it's, it's not binding to a receptor that produces a, a, a clinical effect. It's all of the signaling cascade and if that signaling cascade is disrupted by really chronic high-dose fentanyl, then, and those restorative processes have not been completed, then yes, you're gonna need that aggressive approach to uh, keep somebody um, out of uh, the danger zone um, so that they're not having the screaming memes um, and, and you can manage them effectively. Thanks for all your work on this and uh, breaking it down for, I'm gonna lit, just tiptoe into the pharmacokinetics aspect of this and I'm just curious about, I just don't understand why the lipophilicity term affects the signaling because it feels like to my understanding the lipophilicity, that, that, that drug is not available for signaling but maybe I don't understand it well and but the I keep hearing that from colleagues, I'm like, just doesn't make sense, and this is starting to help me understand more about that. So the lipophilicity, just I mean, from adipose tissues into the central compartment, basically is just making the drug more constantly available at receptor sites, and so it prolongs its probability of action at the receptor site such that the uh, um, affinity and the intrinsic efficacy does the rest of the work. Okay. So the more of the concentration you have just like in the vicinity of the receptor then allows those two other characteristics making up ale to, to, to do the job. Thank you. All right, thank you. Yep. All right, I always love getting to hear you talk about this. <laughs> Every day, it's, it's wonderful. Okay, um, so uh, always a challenge to follow Mark talking about buprenorphine. <laughs> but um, so we're going to I'm talk a little bit about the clinical context of sort of strategies for how you do dosing for buprenorphine in the emergency department. And a lot of this is going to be sort of based on either trials we've done or things that we've sort of tinkered with over the past probably 10 to 15 years. So they're really sort of, and when you think about how you start buprenorphine in the emergency department, um, there are kind of four buckets of things that, that we really sort of think about. So there is this concept of standard dosing, which it turns out there's really, there's nothing really standard <laughs> about ED dosing, which we'll talk a little bit about. Um, there's this concept of high dose, um, high dose um, buprenorphine, which uh, Mark's really laid out a, a case for why it makes a lot of sense pharmacologically and also clinically. I'm going to talk a little bit about low dose or micro induction. Um, I'm just going to really touch on this as like a thing that exists in the world. I'm not really going to get into that in detail. And then we're going to just talk a little bit about the injectable buprenorphine formulations that are out there. Um, so this is the initial randomized controlled trial that was done um, by Gale, published in 2015. 
um, in JAMA. And the reason, I would assume many of you are very familiar with this study, but the thing that I think um, is not always clear to people um, is the dose that was used in this study. And so um, prior to this study, or around the time many of your addiction colleagues, inpatient, outpatient colleagues were starting with these much lower doses of two to four milligrams of buprenorphine for people who would withdraw. And Gail, being brilliant woman that she is, said, no, we're just gonna start at eight. <laughs> Um, and so that initial study, it was, you know, those are all folks who got, um, who were randomized to the buprenorphine group, got eight milligrams of uh, sublingual buprenorphine, and that was for a clinical opioid withdrawal scale of, of more than 12. Um, the other thing that um, sometimes gets lost when people think about um, this study that is a really important component is that about half of the people who got buprenorphine actually had unobserved uh, initiation. So when you're sort of thinking about talking to your ED colleagues about um, how this is a safe and easy thing to do, you know, they started with eight milligrams and they were very, they did just fine at, at, at home. So that's sort of laying the landscape of where we are. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about a case um, and there are a couple of cases throughout just to sort of illustrate uh, different strategies. So this is a 32 year old female with 10 bags a day, IV opioid use and occasional alcohol and cocaine use. Um, so comes into the ED, says she last used eight hours ago trying to go cold turkey and then she comes to the ED sort of requesting inpatient detox. Um, Thoughts on what we should do with her? All right. So, um, oh, so heart rate is 90, has some restlessness, but can sit still. This is the cow score. Um, I'm sure it's very, very familiar to many of you, but for those of you who um, came into this thinking this might be an intro to buprenorphine session, <laughs> um, you know, this is the cow score. This is how we actually calculate opioid withdrawal. So I just wanted to include that there for those. Um, the most important things when you're thinking about dosing somebody or starting buprenorphine is, you know, whether or not, you know, what you see on the withdrawal scale, what they tell you, and whether that is consistent with sort of their clinical history. And so, you know, this is a person who um, says they last used eight hours ago. They have, you know, symptoms that are consistent with, with uh, withdrawal. And one of the things that I actually um, have really, really moved towards, we use the cow scale, you know, especially for, for uh, research, uh, uh, for research studies. But just asking people if they feel like they're in withdrawal, you know, these people are experts in their own in their own withdrawal, and so you know that is definitely something that um, you know we, we always want to think about and be mindful of. The other thing is just being conscientious of the fact that there is some other could be other clinical um, things at work. You know, could they in the nausea vomiting be a fever? Could they be sick? You know, could they be could there be other things? Um, so this is somebody who decided they were in an inadequate amount of withdrawal. They just started, got eight milligrams of subliquid buprenorphine because this was um, many years ago when that is sort of where, where we were starting at. Felt much better after 20 minutes and they left with uh, 16 milligrams a day. Um, this is a paper that I want to highlight. It was done, um, uh, it was actually um, done uh, looking at, at ED initiated buprenorphine protocols throughout um, sort of a large group of EDs. So there was actually people who had participated in this, the clinical trial that Gail mentioned. And one of the things that we just wanted to highlight is these are the, the protocols that were in place uh, that we went through. And so there's just a ton of variability around sort of thinking about what, what withdrawal scale people use, what time, you know, if they have time frame between, you know, multi-level dose one, dose two, um, different doses, and then precipitate withdrawal guidelines. So this is out there, it's NJCEP open. Um, you know, there is, we, we all sort of have developed ways that we do this in our own emergency department. Um, and so I think we're still trying to, there's still no clear right way or right dose, um, you know, but, but we're definitely leaning more towards um, thinking about higher doses. Um, so case two, this is a 22 year old um, who presents after an opioid overdose, uh, received by standard intranasal naloxone and on evaluation, um, you know, have people small, maybe a little bit of nausea. Um, I don't know if this is something you guys see in your emergency parts, but we often see people who are post naloxone who are actually not substantially in withdrawal. And this is much more common if you get intranasal naloxone. And so, you know, it used to be um, that there was a lot of concern around, you know, giving buprenorphine dosing to folks who had gotten naloxone post overdose. Um, many people in this room have, have, have done that repeatedly and had no problems. Uh, I'm looking at you, Andrew. <laughs> but, um, but this is somebody who actually really, their withdrawal scale is still like pretty low. And so, you know, this is not somebody, even though they just recently got naloxone, this is not somebody that you would wanna um, sort of be aggressive or, or, or push with uh, buprenorphine induction. Um, so this is just a home initiation guide. This is something that um, was developed uh, in our emergency department. Um, is available on the Yale ED website. But it's just a really nice sort of step-by-step. -step. You can sort of walk people through, you know, how to, how to you know, do an observed uh, init buprenorphine init initiation on your own. 
Um, obviously, you know, if this is something that you take, you can change the dosing around based on, on, on what makes sense for your shop and sort of what you're doing right now. Um, so getting into sort of the, the clinical rationale for high dose, um, Mark very clearly sort of laid out a case for, for reasons why you would want to, you know, maximize the, the or minimize the, the time delay to uh, getting, re reaching therapeutic dosing. Um, we certainly know that, um, that uh, when people receive high dose buprenorphine, they reach a therapeutic level much more quickly or rapidly than sort of these slow titrations of two milligrams, you know, and, and another two milligrams in another four hours, which is sort of how the outpatient psychiatrist had, had, had traditionally done it. Um, another, huge, another big benefit for um, high dose buprenorphine is um, it, it actually, you know, not only, you know, occupies those receptors and, and, and um, gets you sort of to a therapeutic level, but it also provides some coverage um, in the sense that um, you, can actually, you can actually have, you know, the effects of this for, for up, to, up to two to three days, which is really, really important if you're thinking about sort of emergency department patients who may or may not be able to get to the pharmacy the next day, they may have transportation issues, they may have, you know, there's a million, million reasons um, why people, you know, are unable to, to sort of necessarily get to the pharmacy the next day. And so this is something that actually helps provide that coverage um, until it gives them a little bit more time to, to sort out that. Um, so this is actually a paper that, that was led by Andrew, talking about high dose induction for, uh, in, the, in the ED. Uh, was certainly one of the, the sort of first leaders in really thinking about, you know, how you, how you do um, high dose. And so this is something they published. It's based on 2018 data. They looked at almost 600 visits. Um, they got 12 or more uh, milligrams of buprenorphine. Um, administered during 366 encounters. Um, they actually had 138 that had more than 28 milligrams, and there was you know, no cases of respiratory depression or sedation, and uh, was also no association with dose um, and precipitated withdrawal. So those are like the two things that I feel like we've heard um, over the past time that people are concerned about with high dose buprenorphine, and uh, that's why it's so important that this was actually published and sort of out in the literature. Um, you know, that that's actually, you know, something that we can think about, but it is, is that actually not, not really a, a problem. Um, they also did um, uh, publish a paper that came out in actually 2020, and this is important because it's, a, you know, there's a little bit more um, uh, fentanyl use. It's still a lower population uh, that use only about 10%, 9.5% uh, of these cases uh, used fentanyl, but um, in general, they also still had a very low precipitate withdrawal rate, uh, 1.6, um, and had you know, more than four, documented more than 400 patients who, who received high-dose buprenorphine initiation. Um, so this is um, sort of an, a, one of the dosing algorithms that's available on the California Bridge website. Um, you know, as you sort of think about how to, how to do high-dose buprenorphine, you want to think about, you know, use, the individual's use, their, fre their frequency of use, their any treatment history, pharmacy access, patient preference. But in general, I think many of us are starting to lean more towards thinking about uh, doing high dose uh, buprenorphine. The rationale for low dose, um, this is not something that is part of my emergency practice in any way, shape, or form. I know there are people who are thinking about it, um, so we just wanted to cover it. But in general, you know, the re the really the rationale is um, if you have somebody who is, you know, on current opioid agonist treatment for pain, if, they're, if you're trying to cross taper somebody from methadone to buprenorphine, um, if there is this sort of complete intolerance to opioid withdrawal um, or a concern about precipitated withdrawal. So those are the reasons that people think about doing low dosing. Um, and this is just a schematic, uh, something called the Bernese method, uh, which as you can see, it's, it's, it's complicated. Um, and so, you know, and that's, in many ways, that's one of the reasons that, that I have, you know, it, I, I think this is some, it's something that can be very, very challenging for ED patients to take outside. Um, outside the emergency department. The other thing that is really sort of one of the challenges uh, around low-dose considerations, you know, it seems to there has been some, some success reported, particularly in hospitalized patients, people who may be getting agonist treatment for, um, for a painful condition, um, you know, and where they can actually give them their agonist that is, you know, we know it is a safe supply. Um, but the really ED-specific challenges are that it's a complicated dosing regimen, be up to a week before they reach therapeutic dosing. And really the kicker is, is that, um, you know, the absence of withdrawal are having ongoing full agonist exposure. So if you're in the hospital and you're getting full agonist prescribed for your painful condition, you know, that that's, that's certainly one thing. But for our ED patients, if they leave sort of with a microinduction plan, the, the, the thing, the, the plan um, includes them ongoing, having ongoing exposure to illicit fentanyl use. Um, and so, you know, when we think about sort of risk for overdose, you know, as, as Mark pointed out, 
you know, if with these microdosing, these very, very low doses, they're actually not protected from overdose like they are, are, are with higher, higher levels. So the last thing that I want to talk about is there are injectable buprenorphine formulations that are out um, uh, available. Um, so there's sort of two uh, main products. So one is um, a, a monthly injection called Sublicade, um, and that has been FDA approved for probably about two or three years. Um, you know, in general, um, the, the FDA label says that you're not supposed to do treatment initiation with it, that it's supposed to be um, on somebody who has re received at least seven days of sublingual uh, buprenorphine lead-in. Um, I certainly know people who have done, who have, who have done it otherwise, and, and people seem to do just fine. Um, and then there's also um, the uh, CAM2038, which is Buvidol or Brixati. Um, for the clinical trial that, that Gail had mentioned earlier today, we're using the seven-day, there's actually a seven-day version. Uh, of this of this product, which um, you know is certainly a unique thing in the emergency department to be able to provide somebody with seven days of uh, of protection, um, and this is just a little bit around sort of the um, the plasma concentration of um, this is the seven day injection because this is you know sort of what we're using in our emergency department and most most familiar with. Um, but as you can see, so this, the light gray curve, um, when, you, when someone is exposed to something with buprenorphine, you, I mean, you have this sort of rapid uptake um, in the plasma concentration of buprenorphine, whereas with these inject injectable formulations, particularly the, the seven-day one, it's just a much um, sort of slower, slower uptake. Um, and so, you know, we think that, you know, is, is at least part of why, you know, we're able to use this in folks who have a lower withdrawal scale for our, for our clinical protocol. It's actually for people who have a CALS of four or more. Um, but that sort of gentle rise in, bup in buprenorphine con concentration is not the same for the 30-day formulations. Um, and so with that, I'm going to hand it over to Dr. Herring, uh, who's going to talk a little bit about precipitated withdrawal. Hello, everyone. This is a lot of fun to be here um, to talk to you guys about treatment of precipitated withdrawal. Um, and I'm thinking, you know, you know, much of what I'm about to talk about right now is kind of sort of maybe the clinical application of all of the previous talks. So I don't know if you want to jump in as we go along. That's I think that would make a lot of sense too. Um, so the 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 basic idea um, is. When we're, when we're treating precipitated withdrawal, um, we're using the, the framework that Mark and others have helped develop, this idea of equilibrium balance. And the, the, maybe the main take home point is it's very easy to get distracted, it's, it's very easy to get distracted away from the fundamental idea that precipitated withdrawal is simply an opioid problem. Right, you know, because there are so many adjuncts you can use. Right, there are benzos, there are antipsychotics, there are clonidine. It's all, there's the whole social context of it. But fundamentally, it's just you're in an opioid deficit situation, and you have a limited number of tools that will help fix that. Um, and so that's your primary goal is to fix the opioid deficit. So this is the idea um, of opioid balance. So, in pragmatically, well, let, let's say not pragmatically, so hypothetically, right? If we have no other considerations whatsoever and someone is in precipitated withdrawal, from a pharmacologic standpoint, you're going to want to use the most potent, rapid acting, most af highest affinity, highest efficacy opioid you have. So if you happen to have carfentanil, right? That would be the drug of choice, right? It's th because it is fundamentally an opioid problem. That's it. You don't need clonidine. You don't need any. Don't need ketamine. You don't need bup. You would just use carfentanil as quickly as possible. Now, stepping back from that, maybe in the OR you'd have remifentanil, and then into the ER you'll have fentanyl. But the quest, the thing that happens there is that pragmatically the doses we're talking about, where you have a someone who's physically dependent on fentanyl after months of high dose daily exposure, and now you have taken out some of these receptors, you've occupied them with buprenorphine, and you've got these all of very few, maybe smaller numbers of spare receptors, and they might be kind of semi-functional. So the doses you're looking at are really, will really blow your hair back. So you're looking at 200 micrograms of fentanyl every 10 minutes going to two, three, four milligrams. Has anyone ever done that? Right. So it's <laughs> so that just sort of brings us back. Well, okay, 
I could do that, but that's going to require a ton of work within your nursing staff, your medical staff. It brings up all these questions like what is treatment, what's the long term. You know, it just gets really meta and it gets really logistics. It gets really into the implementation realities of things. So then what this boils down to then is in most settings, the tool you have to produce agonism is butyl. It's the one that's safe. It's the one where when you keep going higher, you don't have to wor worry about them suddenly stopping to breathe. You know, the, the amount of opioid, of opioid agonist MME inside of, these, of this buprenorphine is really tremendous. It's very strong. It, this is why it's sort of hard to wrap your head around it, but bup is strong. So there's really nothing that you, nothing that compares to buprenorphine in terms of being able to safely administer a ton of agonist signal quickly. So in most cases, that's gonna be your first move is 16 milligrams of buprenorphine, and if that doesn't work, 16 more. So the, um, now then in terms of the, the, what are you gonna add on to it? The ketamine is this evolving medication that, that we, in terms of our, our understanding of how to use it is evolving. And in, but you can think of it as a way to potentiate an opioid. It will, it will make fentanyl work better or be stronger. It will make morphine work better, be stronger. It will make buprenorphine be, work better, be stronger, kind of pushing it over towards the opioid agonist axis. The reverse way of thinking of that would be that in the perioperative studies, it means it's opioid sparing in that you don't need to use as much opioid. So therefore, the opioid you are using seems to have a greater clinical impact. So that's the idea. Um, it also has this just reality that the, the antidepressant effects of, buprenor of ketamine are very, very real. And so I think we could probably all agree that going through precipitated withdrawal seems like a crummy experience, right? So if you're going to have several weeks of improved mood and outlook, this would be a good time. <laughs> right? So I really don't think that's worth that, that we should overlook that if you get past this 0.5 mg per kg threshold of ketamine, you know, your, it, your outlook on the experience will likely be better for days or even weeks. And it doesn't, and this is where we're really getting to an area, I can't say I'm an expert, but in the pain studies, it doesn't seem to be that it actually sort of changes the, the nociceptive machinery but it's more your own effective appraisal of what's going on, which really sort of drives it up. It's something about how you're perceiving um, what, what happened to you, which again, it seems like a great time um, to have that. Um, so just to reiterate here, you know, what we're calling high dose, you know, the is, so as um, Dr. Harris mentioned in her question, the, this sort of protocol that seemed rather out there of 16 weight, 16, weight 16 is a very common thing now amongst physicians who are coping with people who have chronic exposure to fent illicit fentanyl. It's pretty standard. Um, I know my last clinic, a young man just came from Arizona. He smokes, he told me 60 to 80 of the blues a day. Who knows what that is? Seems like a lot. <laughs> so, um, you know, it's in the clinic, and my clinic is basically like it's, it's in the, the lobby of this ancient hospital that should be knocked down for seismic reasons, but is still standing. <laughs> it's, it's not fancy, right? And there's like no nurses. There's, it's, it's, it's kind of like having a clinic here. So uh, um, just to paint the picture. So the, so the first dose I give him is 16, right? So 16 under the tongue. He's just sitting there. There's like three other people around him. And then I come back, and he's kind of like hunched over, and he looks up at me, and his brow, his his brow, his has a burst forth with its with its with its sweat, you know, and he's and he's kind of looking achy, and it's clearly starting to precipitate, right? And you're in clinic, so what would you, what would you do? Or view, right? Because it's like. You know, you I could take a meteor right away, but then everyone's gonna be like, oh, you screwed up the clinic, Andrew. Like, you know, right? So there's not that much stuff to do. I, I could give him, you know, I could push 500 mics of fentanyl, but I don't have a monitored bed. You know, there's just these logistics, right? So I gave him 24. I gave him 24, right? 
and then we have a little cot, and he lays down, and in an hour and a half, he's better, right? So that's a really common narrative, right? That's a really common occurrence. Um, that is, is something that many, many folks are just out there in the field that we kind of have to go. But let's say he, you know, he got the 24 and he didn't get better, right? Then, then that's when we're going upstairs and we're heading down this path um, where we're gonna put, him, put an IV in, we're gonna put him on a monitor, um, and we're gonna start using ketamine and fentanyl, um, which I, would, you know, I think would be best used together um, to go after that refractory withdrawal. Um, so the, uh, one of the things that I'm not sure when and how to use either benzos or antipsychotics, um, a slide that's not here but more increasingly how I'm thinking about this is there, there's almost like a, maybe like a seizure or migraine or that there is, there's clearly a topography or a trajectory of precipitated withdrawal that has a beginning, like the guy sitting there, where he's just clearly precipitation is happening. But if he's actually, was, he was quiet. You know, he was just, you wouldn't know, you'd have to actually really look in on him. And he was kind of this initial phase and things are going awry. And so there's almost a role for abortives. You know, like what do you, like maybe in this early realm, um, is that where combining a benzodiazepine with your buprenorphine could make sense? You know, it, you know, maybe, for sure. The thing that I can say is that once you're in the acute phase, you know, let, let's say he got the 24 and he didn't get, he's, and he started thrashing, yelling, and every, and there's a crowd of like five people, like, what's going on? What did you do, Dr. Harry? Right? That in this acute phase, if you persist with benzodiazepines and you don't use more buprenorphine or more fentanyl or more ketamine, you're gonna end up with a really complex delirium. And probably of the many, 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 many cases of precipitated withdrawal I've consulted on around the country, the, the folks who, when I get the call, like, you know, oh, Andrew, you know, this guy was so crazy. He got intubated in the ICU and the ICU doctor was pissed at us. It's almost always because there was an over-reliance on benzodiazepines with the thought you could just sedate your way out of it. Um, and you forgot the primary principle that this is an opioid problem. The antipsychotics are really confusing um, to me because uh, you know there's there's a long history of using antipsychotics in the in the detoxification kind of homegrown literature. Um, maybe Mark can speak to how much of that entered into formal study. Um, the the, the bones of that concept and what ha what's happening with dopamine, is it a dopamine depleted state or, or not um, during withdrawal is a little confusing to me, um, but I do know there are, there are data out there of people using olanzapine and Haldol. Um, in general, um, I don't really reach for these, um, um, but I know that some people do. I would actually would kind of turn it back. Is anyone using any psychotics or anyone thoughts on any psychotics? Mark, do you have any thoughts? Well, I, I think you know, somebody, it's more likely they're going to be dopamine depleted in withdrawal. Yeah. Um, and so you may be aggravating. I think it's more like you know, seeing a ticket kind of thing. You just want to stop the activity. Yeah, right? yeah, yeah, that's right. But yeah. when you get under the hood, that may not be the best thing to do. Yeah. So, so I am thinking that, it, uh, so then if we think about this prodrome phase where you, there's kind of Rome, uh, or sorry, <laughs> there's, there's room to kind of tinker with adjuncts where things are getting off the ground, they're not particularly acute. I think there's a lot of, you could think of a lot of room to tinker with benzos and other things. Once you're in the acute phase, you gotta buckle up and you gotta go hard, monitored bed, buprenorphine, ketamine, and be okay with benzos if you need it. 200 mics every 10 minutes go to effect. Don't mess around with benzodiazepines during that acute phase, you'll get really confused. Are they tired because I gave them fentanyl and, I, and I've reached their, their threshold of physical dependence, or are they tired because I gave them so much per se? It's a bad place to be. Then once they've settled out, there's a clear sort of you know, recovery phase where they're not completely better, but they're, they might be a little dysphoric or a lot dysphoric, they're kind of asleep, you wake them up, they have this distinct kind of, um, like jerking kind of almost myoclonic kind of kind of phase. That's again where I think going back to the benzodiazepines, um, things like rapinarol or 
premipexel, these D2, D3 agonists can really just settle and land the ship, land the ship so you've got a comfortable person that you either you can just go to sleep or go home. Um, so then I'll just wrap up again. You know, this whole world of adjuncts is really, I don't know, you know, like when you're, and then can we use these preemptively, you know, for people before they start their bugue? And if you do create your cocktail, which one of these are you gonna use? I mean, they, they all have individual um, evidence of being, of being helpful, right? Um, each one of these, but if you, you get these ridiculous prescriptions or ridiculous order sets, if you're gonna give everybody these, all of these different supportive medications. So there's a lot, to, lot of work to do, I think, around really getting a, a sophisticated, tailored, multimodal strategy to buprenorphine, the induction and treatment of the complications along the way that would really make it more, kind of push it more into pain medicine, acknowledging the heterogeneity. And that there's probably are some people who would really benefit from an alpha-2 agonist, others who might not, some who really would benefit from a D3 agonist and some who, some who wouldn't. And in, in that, that's where the real medicine would come in, it's kind of maybe interesting for the future. Um, so, thank you. One thing you're going to get kicked out to sleep at is where it is. So, yeah, so we can hang out back here. But what about xylitol? I mean, you did with your last slide there. I mean, what's the best approach given that related to everything? Yeah, you know, I think that just because I, in San Francisco, California, xylazine, no I. Like, it's just, we don't see it at all. Um, so I would probably ask Dr. Haraz, um, and when it comes to anything to do with xylazine. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.